It's 4 o'clock on Thursday. You know what that means, don't you? It's time for another exciting episode of Taxi's Quarantini Happy Hour. Woohoo! Yeah, baby. And thank you, fake band. Thank you, fake audience. Let's go see who's in that chat room. Whoops, where's my phone? I need to silence my security camera because the workers are outside okay whoops that's not it all right i think we're good hello bob gunnerfeld ian shortle akira canyon dan weber jesse j peck nancy collell darren fletcher <laughs> yep we are still under construction <laughs> I literally just plopped my butt back in the chair about 10 seconds before I launched the show today, and I'm almost certain that at some point I'm going to need to jump up out of my chair. Um, the guys on top of uh, Hello, Riffs That Rule, Andre Stepanian, uh, the, the guys that got rid of the termite stuff uh, are also like re-rat proofing the house so uh, one of the garage doors the middle garage door and each one of you who's had a 16 year old uh, that just got their driver's license knows exactly what I'm about to say which is inevitably a kid with a new driver's license will drive their car into the garage door uh, so our daughter Hannah did that as her initiation to pulling in the garage um, so the guy said, hey, we can replace that seal on the bottom of the garage door for you, which they did, but they only had a black seal and the other two garage doors had gray seals. So, you know, I just couldn't see myself pulling in the garage every night looking at a, uh, a black seal in the middle with a gray seal on either side. So my wife is at the DIY center right now buying more black seals so that we've got black seals on all three doors. Will it be the right size when she gets home in five or 10 minutes? That remains to be seen. I may have to jump up and go survey the situation. I may have to leave the kids alone in the classroom for a few minutes on your own. Uh, isn't Gray Seal and Elton John song? Yeah, but not today, not in the Lasco household. Oh, that's weird today. I'm seeing like, are you guys seeing the background, the wall around the clock kind of flickering or is that just me? That's weird. Where are the cookies? You know what? My wife's not home. The cookies didn't come out all that great. Um, take the camera, make it part of the show. Well, it's not as, I have to take the laptop with me. Um, so, interesting, yeah, it's flickering a little bit. That is weird. I've got the same exact lighting that I do, I think, yeah every day weird 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 uh hello akira jesse edmund il rosso um that is so weird don't know why that's happening um anyway uh want to let you know that john pearson just texted me wherever my phone is about 10 minutes ago and he said oops sorry message from my wife uh, um, what did JP say? He says, all done and all good. I'll try to join the chat tomorrow. Thank you, and please thank everyone for their prayers and good thoughts. So there you go. JP, a successful removal of the thing, the awful thing. Whew, that's good news. Um, Anyway, uh, hello, Spiritual, John Hemingway, Michael McGraw, Greg Carroza, hello all, <clears throat> Brad Gray. So uh, I actually dog-eared a few more pages in Stephen Pressfield's book. Oh, also I want to let you know that uh, I just got confirmation about 20 minutes ago that uh, Gato Blanco will be joining us on Monday's Taxi TV. Um, apparently, uh, Gato's new record is doing even better than I thought at, uh, on jazz radio. And uh, so Gato has agreed. He, he's actually really, really, really shy. Um, shuns publicity. Um, 
but he's agreed to uh, do an interview with us uh, on Monday's Taxi TV. So we're going to play you some songs from Gato's new record. And then, uh, hello, Rick Cabot Podmore, Michael McGraw. We're going to play some music and then... Uh, I'm going to call Gato, and uh, his English is not so bueno. <laughs> so we're going to try uh, try to get some good answers out of him, but there may be a little bit of language difficulty. Um, how are you guys all doing today? Oh, this Andre says, reminder about the story you were going to tell us uh, about Billy Joel. <laughs> all right. So... What year was it? I'm going to say it was probably around 1976 or 1977. Um, I was working, I was producing an artist named Robert somebody, and I can't remember who he was. <laughs> I can't remember. Um, he wasn't famous yet. I think the guy had just gotten a record deal. Uh, and I was doing, I think, three or four songs for the record. Gosh, what was his name? Anyway, um, he, it never went anywhere. Um, <laughs> it was cursed by the Lasco production curse. Um, Robert, gosh, can't think of his name. It's funny, the guy was actually uh, an electrician that only worked on rewiring Rolls-Royce cars. So he worked at a Rolls-Royce dealership in the mechanic shop, but all he did was fixing electrical. Apparently, uh, Rolls-Royces have a lot of electrical problems. Who knew? You drop a couple hundred K on a car and it comes with electrical problems. British cars are kind of famous for that. I used to have, uh, at one point in my life, uh, an Austin Healey 3000, and at another point, a uh, Triumph Spitfire, and both of them had just horrible electric issues. Uh, sometimes I would like hit a bump and all the meters would go, <laughs> just jump up like, you know, a quarter of a tank on the gas thing. Uh, if I was doing 70, all of a sudden I was doing 75. Um, it was pretty funny. Anyway, uh, gosh, I, it's gonna bug me all night, Robert, whatever. So, okay, so I was working on that record in South Florida, but the artist was from New York. So I flew, oh, I remember what it was. I flew to New York with the artist manager. They wanted me to go see him live. And he was playing at a club on the Upper West Side, I believe on 72nd Street near Columbus. And it was called either, I think it was JP's was the name of the club. So, uh, I went into the restroom and I'm doing what guys do in a restroom, standing there at the urinal, minding my own business. And uh, this person walks in and, you know, standing right next to me at the urinal. And I went, hey, how you doing? You know, typical guy thing. You have to be really careful not to look down. You have to keep eye contact, you know. Hey, how you doing? And I thought the guy looked familiar. I, I think Billy Joel was just starting to become a thing at that point. He wasn't like ubiquitous. Um, yeah, I did get the termite sorted, uh, Robbie. We're still working on that right now, actually. Um, and uh, I look over and I thought he looks familiar. And uh, all of a sudden the guy pulls a little vial of a substance, which I won't mention in words because I don't want to get the video banned, but he pulls out this little vial of a white fluffy substance. One of those little like bronze colored glass vials with the plastic screw on top that had the little spoon hanging from a chain on it, if you know what I mean. Um, and uh, while the guy is taking care of business, now remember, he had to uh, arrange himself to take care of business using his hands, I would think, <laughs> and uh, then pulls out the vial, and, and he's still standing there, I presumably taking care of business. I don't think he'd uh, zipped back up. And uh, he pulls out the vial and uh, dips a little spoon. So he's holding the vial with one hand, takes a little spoon with the other hand, and uh, it says, here you go, want a bump? So of course I said no. Uh, anyway, that that was it. And then when I walked out of the restroom and went back to sit at the table in the club with the manager, he goes, 
wow, you were in the, the men's room with Billy Joel. And I went, I was? I thought that dude looked familiar. So there you go. Billy Joel is a generous, kind and caring man who will share his substances with complete strangers while standing at a urinal. Good job, Billy. Uh, he is a brilliant writer and a great singer. Um, I used to love when I first met my wife, Deborah. Uh, she lived in Santa Monica and I lived in Woodland Hills. And probably three nights a week, I would drive over the hill through the Santa Monica Mountains on uh, Topanga Boulevard, T Topanga Canyon, whatever it is. Yeah, Topanga Canyon Boulevard, and, uh, which is a very windy, mountainous road that goes through the Santa Monica Mountains. And uh, I had, at the time, I had a company Beamer that they actually leased for me. It was a black 325i with a sunroof. And I would open the sunroof and I would put Billy Joel on and play We Didn't Start the Fire, just loud as I could. Uh, hello, Martin. And uh, one night I was going through there. Now I knew the road really, really well because I drove it so frequently and I had this really spiffy car and I would go through those turns much faster than any law would allow. And on a particular night, um, I was going a little faster than usual, and all of a sudden the red lights go on behind me. It's like, oh crap. So I pull over and the cop walks up to my car and he goes, you were doing about 62 miles an hour in a 35 zone. And just to let you know, you put your car up on the right two wheels in that last turn. And I went, really? ouch so um anyway the cop was writing out a ticket and i was prepared to pay a very hefty fine when all of a sudden the cop got called on his radio that somebody had driven their car off a cliff and he had to go take care of that so i never got the ticket so somebody else's intensely bad misfortune was my good fortune so there you go uh everything you need to know about my personal involvement with billy joel and his music <laughs> the cop said, where's the fire? And I said, yeah, we didn't start that fire. Billy Joel's a great artist, though. Uh, just tremendous artist. Um, I actually used to know Phil Ramone, who's no longer with us, who uh, engineered and produced those records. And uh, wow. Can you talk about, Nancy wants to know, can you talk about the ongoing importance of one's personal professional reputation? Nance, if I had one, I'd talk about it. Uh, our name alone can be like our calling card in many circles. Your thoughts, Michael. Um, yeah, you know, I'd be happy to address that. Um, how can I say this? It's a lot easier to earn a bad reputation quickly than it is to earn a good reputation slowly. Um, people love... Uh, salacious stuff. Um, they remember people that do boneheaded stuff. Uh, somebody years ago asked me on a taxi TV if there's a blacklist in the industry. There's not. There's certainly not an official blacklist in the industry. Um, but I will tell you that there have been several times, if not many times over my lengthy career, especially this career in uh, the music licensing side of the business, where people have done some really dopey or offensive stuff. And then at some point a little later, I would, you know, like a month after an incident where maybe a particular library owner would call to tell me about something really dopey that in most cases it was a taxi member and that's why they would tell me because um, they wanted me to call the member and say, dude, what are you doing? Anyway, I, I can remember going to maybe it was a PMA thing, something at the Sportsman's Lodge, which is a place where a lot of industry people have um, like award nights and, you know, monthly meetings, that sort of stuff. They've got a room that holds two or 300 people and you have, you know, like hotel chicken or hotel salmon and speakers get up and do their thing. So, uh, wow, Martin, happy birthday. Um, <laughs> Dan Weber said it's a good subject because I'm a bonehead. Thank you, Deb. Did it, was it the right size? Uh, they don't know and they weren't under the impression they were doing that for you. Oh. Um, do me a favor. Go grab me my wallet from over there, please. Yeah, they said that might be an additional charge. 
I just, might have to come back to you tomorrow. They told me it was a five minute thing. Sorry, folks. Uh, my wallet's over there on the thingy. They're still working on the roof anyway. Tell them I'm very appreciative for all the good work they've done. Okay. Um, one of the guys just nailed in some gutters that were loose out there. They've done a couple little extras. So just tell them Michael wanted that, them to split that. Okay. Anyway, thank you. Sorry. Here I am. Back to the show. I should have really canceled the show today. A lot going on here at Shea Lasco. Uh, so what was I talking about? Oh, uh, so the boneheaded incident. And so I sat down at a table with probably five or six library owners and a composer or two, and I think a music attorney, I think there were 10 of us at this table. And all of a sudden the library owner brought up this incident and said, do you guys believe that this happened? Blah, 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 blah. And didn't even mention the composer who had done the boneheaded thing, didn't mention him by name. And all of a sudden, like three or four other people at the table went, oh, I bet you that's so-and-so, and they were right. So this is a great example of somebody who obviously had done boneheaded stuff um, on several occasions with several people in the industry, and they had, in fact, earned a reputation as a bonehead. So there's just a, a great example of how bad news travels fast. Uh, is there a foreign forum area for boneheads? <laughs> I, I think every one of the forums has had a bonehead in there at some point or another, Tony. <laughs> um, now, as far as building a good name for yourself, uh, we've talked about this kind of endlessly on Taxi TV, which is just over deliver, under promise, over deliver, beat deadlines, Make sure you understand the mission at hand. If you're dealing directly with a, a music supervisor or a library owner uh, and they've got a specific request, um, just, you know, meet the request. Do it. Don't, don't call them an hour before the deadline and say, oh man, I was waiting for, you know, like uh, downloading a new synth patch, blah, blah, blah. What, you know, dog ate my homework, whatever the excuse is. Don't call them up and say, I'm not going to miss the deadline. Make the deadline. Just make the deadline. And the more frequently you do that, the more they will like you because there are a lot of people that probably don't get that etiquette thing and that professionalism thing right. So if you do, you will be somebody who is right here in Broca's area, the part of the brain that um, makes people notice stuff. It's right above the ear in the gray area. <laughs> That's why they call that the gray area. Anyway, uh, you want them to remember you for the good stuff. Oh, this person's reliable. Oh, this person always gets the brief right. Oh, this person always delivers a little bit early. Uh, this person's really easy to work with. If I ask for a change, they say, no problem. When do you want it? Three hours from now? No problem. And they send it back in an hour. So those are all the things you can do to earn a good reputation. Um, I don't know. Uh, any other questions about that, Nancy? Uh, there goes Mrs. Lasco. Goodbye, Mrs. Lasco. Um, thank you for running that errand. Uh -huh. Anyway, um, so there's that. Uh, miracle of story, bad news. Moral of story. Uh, bad news travels fast. Don't be a bonehead. Thank you. Yes. And uh, what's the opposite of being a bonehead? Um, I had an I had an idea, but I'm not going to say it on the show. <laughs> oh man! Hello, Trev. That's right. People do remember the negatives. They really do. I don't know why that is. I don't know where why we're wired to like salacious news, want to spread that salacious news around. Uh, and why we remember negative stuff more than positive stuff. You know, being the owner of a small company. Um, I can tell you that there have been times where I have reprimanded a staff member. Um, there was one a few months ago, once we were working remotely, where I was just, I threw my hands up in the air. I was so upset um, about something that I had you know, patiently corrected 
numerous times, I'm talking five, six, seven, eight, nine times over a period of a year or two. And one day I just lost it in an email and said, enough, you guys, it was actually two folks, enough, you guys, you know, I've had it. What is the deal? Why can't you get this right? And I think I used the F word, but not at them. It was like, you know, I'm effing, um, I've effing had it with this, not like you're an effing whatever. So uh, one of the people got it, understood my frustration. And yeah, would I prefer to have not lost it? But it was just one of those days where just tons of stuff was heaped on me and things weren't going well. Um, So one of the employees uh, wrote me up, sent a letter to HR saying, you know, he's so negative, blah, 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 blah. What? The same employee forgot was how many times I've walked into his office and said, hey man, good work on this, or thanks for getting that done early. Um, Hopefully uh, Ariana and Bria would come to my defense in a court case and say, yeah, you know, he's, he's, uh, you know, he'll compliment good work or thank you for getting stuff done on time or getting it done early. Um, But it's the negative thing that stuck out, made the impression. And uh, so there you go. Try and remain positive. Um, Give out trophies just for running the race. (laughs) There's your your pose for the day, Ariana. (laughs) Oh, man. Jonathan Moore says, "Positive, positive won't hurt you, negative will. It's a safety mechanism, yep. Uh, boy, the, it's really laggy with uh, what's going on in the chat room with what I'm yammering on about, but uh, rhymes with Rickhead. No, it wasn't the word I was thinking of, but th- that one will work. Darren Moss says, there's a joke about this, something about a guy who helped build a village with his bare hands, um, but people never call him a village builder. But if you have relations with just one goat, (laughs) there you go. Maybe that's where the expression, he got my goat, (laughs) comes from. (laughs) Oh, man. You know, positivity does go a long way. Sometimes it feels disingenuous, you know, when uh, you're in the moment and you want to give out a compliment and do something positive. um, And you feel like you've done it too much. At least I have that. That's maybe my own insecurity. But, uh, you know, if there are three days in a row that I compliment the same person on the staff, I wonder if they think when I walk out of the room, does he really mean that or is he just like kissing my butt every day? (laughs) Hold on, I must re-mute the phone. Apparently I didn't mute it correctly before. Um, Okay, so there's that. Any other questions before I launch into a couple of pages from Pressfield's book, The War of Art? I did find his stuff. I I was pretty sure I had Pressfield's uh, information in my... uh, contacts and I do so I am going to reach out to him about doing the road rally maybe I could make Stephen Pressfield the uh, keynote speaker as long as he's only got to do it on a telephone right okay I dog-eared some pages with really big dog ears wow all is quiet in the chat room I'm astonished. Okay. Um, M. Lasco and a microphone equals great taxi TV. Thanks. I love, ooh, I love my microphone. It's a sturdy, good sounding microphone, that little AT, whatever it is. Um, This could be a discussion about what do you value in your professional relationships? Reliable, reliability, trustworthiness, what are yours? Um, Yeah, I I would think, um, 
I used to say that I trust somebody enough to let them drive my wife cross country. Uh, and then at some point somebody said, you gotta quit saying that. And I thought, yeah, that's really unfair to the guy who's driving my wife. Just kidding, honey. <laughs> I am just kidding. But uh, yeah, I, I really, really deeply cherish trust. Um, there's a reason Rob Shirelli and I have been friends for 30 some years. You know, I, I would literally trust him with my life. That's not a figure of speech. Um, and I'm sure that he would feel the same way. So uh, <laughs> we're waiting. Yes, we are. <laughs> um, trust is everything. I really look for that in the people I work with at Taxi. Um, I once had somebody on my staff who I would trust with my life. We have remained good friends. He made a dumb little mistake that cost the company twenty thousand dollars 20 grand with one little dopey mistake and i could see in his eyes he thought he was getting fired and i just said hey man everybody makes a mistake i'm just appreciative that you were honest enough to come to me and say i made a mistake that just cost you twenty thousand bucks and that's why you're not losing your job so that's how much i appreciate honesty and trust trust them with my wallet. Yeah, there are a lot of people I would trust with my wallet, but then not trust them in other areas of my life. Oh, Ronald Schultz, thank you. He says, that's why I joined Taxi. I trust you and your staff. Yeah, we have an awesome staff. Uh, right now, seriously, it's the best staff we've had in, in a lot of years. Um, I really, I cherish them. Hello, Keith LeBrant. By the way, I, I listened and I will try and call you tonight i've got a after the show gonna have dinner then i've got to call somebody else back and i don't know if that's a 15 minute conversation or an hour and a half conversation i totally blew a meeting this morning i was on a uh, a meeting this morning uh, with three gents in another country on a, a google chat thing a, a video chat and the meeting was going so well but it lasted so long that i totally went over time and blew another meeting which i felt terrible terrible about um uh but i did listen the answer is definitely on the right track um spiritual says dang twenty thousand dollars i'll be like bro this is a big one honey i'm coming home <laughs> yeah you know uh 20 grand nothing to sneeze at that is for sure um Okay, let me find, where'd that page go? One of my big dog ears. Was something I really wanted to talk about. Oh, here we go. Um, I wake up, uh, this is what a writer's day feels like. Uh, one of the chapters or, or sections of the Stephen Pressfield book. And I think that many of us can relate to this. I wake up with a gnawing sensation of dissatisfaction. Already I feel fear. Already the loved ones around me are starting to fade. I interact. I'm present, but I'm not. Uh, I'm not thinking about the work. I'm already uh, consigned I'm, I've already consigned that to the muse. What I am aware of is resistance. I feel it in my guts. I afford it the utmost respect because I know it can defeat me on any given day as easily as the need for a drink can overcome an alcoholic. So true. Um, yeah, resistance, man. It just creeps in. There's little, little you can do to stop it. I go through the chores, the correspondence, the obligations of daily life. Again, I'm there, but not really. The clock is running in my head and I know I can indulge in daily crap for a little while, but I must cut it off when the bell rings. I do that every day of my life. I uh, get involved in the daily crap. You know, I, I make a list of things that I've got to do the next day, all taxi related. They go in my, you know, day runner. I write them down uh, and the next morning I pop open my laptop. Usually I'm looking at it by any, I don't know, anywhere between 6.30 and 7.30 in the morning in bed. 
and I start answering emails. And next thing you know, I'm looking at some stupid news story that I probably shouldn't waste my time on and go down the rabbit hole of anything I can do to distract myself because I know that the work that I, that made it to my daily list is the hard stuff. It's always the hard stuff. I don't even bother putting the easy stuff on the list because I will just gravitate right to easy and avoid the hard stuff. So the easy stuff, I either remember it or I don't, but the hard stuff makes it to my daily list. I'm keenly aware, this is Pressfield again, I'm keenly aware of the principle of priority, which states, A, you must know the difference between what is urgent and what is important, and B, you must do what's important first. You know why? Because we will all, at least I think all of us, maybe you guys aren't guilty of this, it's just me, but I think that um, we tend to take little things that are easier and we treat them as urgent because that way we can justify the fact that we did them when we know what we're really doing is avoiding the important hard things, right? Nobody wants to start the hard thing. But really, I believe that is one of the secrets to success is training yourself to tackle the hard stuff first. Um, I wrestle with that all the time. I'm not great at it, but I do absolutely find on the days where I tackle the hard stuff first and then go down the list with easy as being the last thing I do that day, I may feel a little less satisfied when I knock off those two or three easy things at the end of the day, but it is satisfying knowing that you've, uh, you know, you've accomplished those big, difficult tasks. Nobody likes to start out with the hard stuff, but you should. Uh, Dan Weber says, daily crap makes me very exhausted at night. So there's that. Good sleep sometimes if I'm lucky. Yeah, I'm not a great sleeper either. I habitually, uh, like I go to bed anywhere between like midnight at the earliest um, and 2 a.m., and I frequently wake up at 6, 6.30, 6.45, 7 o'clock, no alarm clock. I just wake up. Um, it's, I didn't used to be like that, you know. For much of my life, I would go to bed at 2 and wake up at 9. But uh, one of our daughters, uh, for the last two years she lived under this roof, was getting up at 6 a.m. because she had a, a far drive to go to the school that she went to. So she would get up at 6 and walk out the door, I think, at 6.30. And I think that's what triggered my you know, internal clock to stick with 6 a.m. Um, Akira says, yeah, I think Stephen Covey mentioned doing the big rocks first. Yep. Yeah, you know, um, a former vice president of Taxi, a guy named Doug Minnick, who I've mentioned on the show before, and I have tremendous affection and respect for, he always said, uh, look at every difficult task as a salami and just take it one slice at a time. I believe he was right about that. Uh, Tim Ferriss, I read his book, the first one. I tried to read the second one, didn't love it. Tim Ferriss says, put at the top of your list the thing that if you achieved it would make the other things easier or irrelevant. There you go. Um, Tim Ferriss is the author of the four hour work week. I tried some of the stuff in that book. I just don't believe that I could outsource, you know, a lot of my daily tasks to, um, somebody working remotely in India, I think he said, or wherever. Um, it's a problem that I have. I don't know if other people share this or not, but I really want stuff to get done right. And I really have to trust somebody um in the context of work in order for me to delegate um i guess that's a big compliment to ariana and bria that uh they're two people even though bria has gone from the company she's still working for us on some project stuff so i mentioned her but um yeah those two young ladies are people that i trust and uh you really need to surround yourself with people that you trust but they're just some things that um that you got to do yourself. And it's not because you don't trust other people. It's that they may not have the experience or the skill set that you have yet, and they need more years to develop that. Um, oh, Bria's on the show today. Hello, Bria. Well, there you go. I complimented you, even though I had to fire you. <laughs> I didn't fire her. She ran away and got married. She dumped us for a husband. Um, 
Trust is a sign of good leadership. Your team will make or break you every time. Yep. Okay. Um, so let's see. Uh, what's important is the work. That's the game I have to sit, suit up for. That's the field in which I have to leave everything I've got. Do I really believe that my work is crucial to the planet's survival? Of course not. But it's as important to me as catching that mouse is to the hawk circling outside my window. He's hungry. He needs a kill. So do I. So there you go. Let's all go kill a mouse. <laughs> um, I'm sorry. I'm reading ahead to see if there's anything else in that subject. Uh, no. Okay. Let's move on to another one. Uh, this is under the, the heading of how to be miserable. <laughs> Do we need any help with this from Stephen Pressfield? I think all of us are pretty capable of being miserable on our own. Violence is never the answer. Liz, have you met gophers? Seriously? I'm at the point now where it's not just good enough to trap the gophers. I want the gophers to suffer. <laughs> well, only one particular gopher. There's one that's been hanging out for like two weeks and nothing I do works on this gopher. Um, okay, the artist committing himself to his calling has volunteered for hell, whether he knows it or not. Oh. Sorry, reading makes me sleepy. Maybe I should read at night instead of watching TV. My wife always says that. Um, the artist committing, to, committing himself to his calling has volunteered for hell, whether he knows it or not. He will be dialing for, or dining for the duration on a di diet of isolation, rejection, self-doubt, despair, ridicule, contempt, and humiliation. What a laundry list. Isolation, rejection, self-doubt, despair, ridicule, contempt, and humiliation. Wow, that's a lot to sign up for just because you want to be a songwriter, right? The artist must be like that Marine. He has to know how to be miserable. He has to love being miserable. He has to take pride in being more miserable than any soldier or suave or jet jockey because this is war, baby, and war is hell. Absolutely true. I think I experienced every one of those emotions on a seriously daily basis the first couple of years at Taxi. Uh, as, as I've mentioned before in this show, um, gut-wrenching, bone-chilling pain, the kind that makes you curl up in the fetal position and cry yourself to sleep. How am I going to get up and do this again tomorrow? How, how, how am I going to get up and do this again tomorrow? Because failure is not an option. Failure is for wussies. I am absolutely convinced you can accomplish any reasonable goal, and when I say reasonable, again, going back to my daughter wanting to start being an, a Formula One driver at the age of almost 24 years old, that's not really a reasonable goal because other uh, Formula One drivers have, you know, 20 years experience under their belt before they ever get behind the wheel of a Formula One car. Um, so she would, by, by the time she had that amount of experience, she would be old enough to be a team owner, not a team driver. So that's not realistic, in my opinion. Um, then again, my daughter has proved me wrong on some other pretty uh, big, hairy, audacious goals before, so I try not to discourage her. She can't be discouraged, actually. Um, but yeah, it, it's if you just don't let failure be an option, if the goal is reasonable, and reasonable means there's not like, you know, I'm, God forbid, dying of cancer and I want to be president of the United States in three and a half months. That's an unreasonable goal. Um, I'm 19 years old. And I'd like to be president of the United States someday. That gives you a good runway. You can build up, get the speed going to accomplish that goal. So see it through a lens of is it realistic? And if it, it's realistic and reasonable, then never, ever, ever, ever give up be a dream believer. Um, is that a monkey song? Yeah, or if you want to be a running back in the NFL at age 66, not quite reasonable. There you go. You could be one of those tackle dummies they use on scrimmages. 
<laughs> oh man, could you imagine getting tackled by a lineman? You know, like remember remember the fridge from the Chicago Bears? Could you imagine that guy? He'd break every rib in my body. Uh, my next door neighbor tried the uh, wolf urine to get rid of the coyote that visits our backyards, and it didn't work. But you can get you can get wolf or coyote urine on Amazon. Um, <laughs> would that be funny to put like wolf urine in somebody's bong? <laughs> I'm sadistic. <laughs> I need help. <laughs> uh, oh boy. Um, okay, another page or two. The professional dedicates him or herself to mastering technique, not because he believes technique is a substitute for inspiration, but because he wants to be in possession of the full arsenal of skills for when the inspiration comes. Let's think about that one for a minute. You don't master techniques because you believe that a technique is, the ins you know, is a substitute for inspiration or even for the muse. But you want to have, the I, I, he calls it an arsenal, I call it a quiver of skills when the inspiration does show up. So there you go. All the people who are songwriters that say, I just simply wait for the muse and no, I'm not going to read a songwriting book or I'm not going to take a songwriting course or I'm not going to listen to feedback from a taxi screener because my inspirations are just so good, so rich, so deep, so amazingly wonderful everybody will love my stuff. Well, maybe they are really good inspirations. Maybe the muse does knock on your door more frequently than uh, she does for other people. But if you don't have a mastery of the craft of songwriting, you're still going to write crappy songs. Songs that just aren't structured well. The human ear, the brain, loves structure. TV shows have a structure. They have a story arc. Movies have <clears throat> a structure and a story arc. Songs have an arc. Instrumental cues have an arc. Our brains are, it's almost visceral. It's almost like we feel in our body. We're conditioned, I don't know from what, but we are conditioned to like stuff in an organized, forward-moving way that gives it purpose, right? So you need those skills. You need the skills in your arsenal. Pressfield, once again, is right. All right, enough Pressfield for today. I don't want to sit here and read his whole damn book to you. Um, Il Rosso says, we want music making techniques to be effortless because making music is hard enough as it is. That sounds reasonable. Who, ha ha, who is ghost of young Michael? I don't get that, Amanda. What the hell are you talking about? Buy a gopher snake at the pet store. There you go, Cass. <laughs> That's right. Starve that sucker for a month and then release it down the hole. That's a great idea. That's a great idea. And I'm going to tie a little string to the end of the gopher snake's tail. So when I feel him jiggling a lot, I know that he's got that gopher. And I'm going to pull him out of that hole just to laugh at the gopher and go, gotcha, sucker. Uh-oh. I'm in trouble. Oh, no, I'm not. She's going to talk to the construction dudes, not me. Uh, what is a bus on a mixing board? Okay, there you go. A technical question. Um, if you were to open a recording console, the physical existence of a bus, actually, you know how recording consoles have a bunch of channels? Oh, there's Ghost of Young Michael. Hello. <laughs> um if you open up a recording console, it, it, you know, it's got all those strips and each strip is, is identical. They all lock in with little, I don't know what you call them, um, connectors at the end, down at the bottom of those strips. And they go into a motherboard that runs the width. Uh, I know the closet door behind me is open. We leave it open all the time so it doesn't reflect light from that door that's right back there. Uh, if the door is on an angle, it doesn't reflect. Um, 
Okay, so everything uh, sits on this motherboard, and in the motherboard, you know those little strips, they're called LANDS, L-A-N-D-S, uh, like you see on printed circuit boards, the little highways that carry the electricity? So a bus in that context is actually those LANDS, those strips, those highways that carry the electricity. A mixed bus is the stereo output of a recording console. So, uh, for instance, if, let's say you've got a 36 channel console with 36 channel strips in it, and all the, all the strips have connectors that go to the motherboard, and whatever comes out of those, unless told otherwise, automatically goes to the mix bus, which are two strips, that run all the way to the output of the console and, and they pair off or branch off when they get uh, to a certain point. Some of the electrons from the mix bus go to the uh, wire that goes to the amplifier that powers your monitors. Um, other stuff will go out to the outputs of your two-track tape machine, whatever form that takes nowadays. Um, Others go to, uh, let's see, where else would a mix bus go? Oh, to a stereo compressor that is attached to the mix bus so that you can compress the whole mix. So there you go. Buses, lands, motherboards. Yep, there's everything you need to know. Yep, Kess, that's the term, lands. Yep. I have speakers, not monitors. That's all right. Oh, my stomach's growling. So it transports music like a taxi. That's right. <laughs> Very good. I'd like a sub for my bus. Uh, if you miss your bus, you can catch the next one. Oh, <laughs> uh, what else? Ask me some other recording stuff. See, I've already shared with you my French horn record, my microphone technique for the French horn, which you'll probably never record in your lifetime anyway, so that was worthless information. Um, any other unusual instruments you'd like to know how to mic? Because I've been fortunate in my engineering career to have done way more than rock and roll. Uh, so I know how to, how to mic many instruments. How old was I when I knew I wanted to work in music? I was nine years old watching the Beatles on the Ed Sullivan Show. And as soon as they walked off the stage, I turned to my mom and dad and said, that's what I want to do when I grow up. How do you mic a Bodran? Is a Bodran that flat Irish drum? Okay, yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, I would mic one of those. Frankly, it depends on how hard you're playing it. Um, it depends on the room that you're playing it in, um, how featured it is in the song. But as a default, just where do you start with uh, miking something like that? Um, dynamic mics are often great for percussive instruments, especially percussive instruments that don't have too much of a note to them or too much bottom end to them. Um, a Sennheiser 421, a Shure 57 will almost always sound good. I use it every single time I record a Bodran. Every time. Um, somebody else said, oh, tell me about the French horn technique. Um, honestly, you don't want to record a French horn by sticking like an 87 into the bell. I'm looking around to see if I have anything that represents a French horn bell. Um... Hang on, I'll be back with a prop. I know just the thing to get. French horn bell. Ta-da! So I have seen, uh, now the funnels we have aren't big enough. 
listen to that. Beautiful. Sounds just like a French horn. Uh, so I have seen engineers that are great rock and roll engineers, like multi-platinum level rock and roll engineers. And I've watched them record like a string or a brass date. And they will take a French horn and they will stick an 87 right there. And then they wonder why later, after everybody's gone, including the uh, triple scale French horn player, I hear all these valve noises. I hear all this breath. Well, uh, that's because you stuck the microphone two or three inches away from where all that stuff is happening. Duh. So what you want to do with the French horn is take the French horn player. If it's, if, if it's like a French horn overdub, or if, even if it's playing in an ensemble situation, anytime you can stick a French horn with the bell blowing, obviously backwards, into a corner, and then take, uh, so have the French horn player be like somewhere between four and six, six feet out from the corner and then stick a microphone in Omni between the bell and the corner. So like three feet away from the bell. And you're going to get this very round, brassy, beautiful sound because you're getting the full harmonic range of the bell. What you're not getting is too much of the breath or any of the valve noise, generally speaking. Um, okay, so there you go. That was that one. Somebody else had another question. Let me scroll back up. When should you use a limiter? When you want to limit something. Uh, Peter Rahill says my friend stuck a trumpet mouthpiece on the end of a six foot garden hose spinning it around made it sound like a Leslie speaker yeah you need to get some new friends Peter <laughs> that person clearly had a little too much time uh, or was it Bill Nye the science guy um What's the ML way to mic a drum kit with five mics? I've got to think about this. Um, how would I mic a drum kit with five mics? Okay. Uh, Sennheiser 421 on the kick drum. I've already talked about this before. A fluffy feather pillow pressed medium hard up against the... First of all, take the front head off. Uh, press a pillow up against the remaining back head, but not too tightly, not too loosely, followed by a folded over moving blanket to add a little heft and keep the pillow in its place. And then take a Sennheiser 421 and stick it in there at about a 45 degree angle from about three inches in from the side of the shell and pointing at the beater, which is obviously on the other side of that head. And you should get a nice heart attack drum sound uh, on the kick. Snare drum, 57. If there's the, there's the drum, a 57 like that. And hopefully the 57 is not angled too much at the hi-hat. You're going to get a lot of bleed anyway. So if you can angle the 57 at the drum, but not in the direction of the hi-hat, you'll be in good shape. So that's two microphones. Um, If you've got two tom-toms, you guys are going to laugh at this, two, two mounted. I'm trying to cut back on my mic usage for this. So if you've got two rack mount toms and a floor tom, take an 87 or a 414, any microphone that you can put in figure eight. I think you can put an 87 in figure eight. Um, okay, if those are your two rack mounted toms, how can I do this? Here's your microphone, okay? And if it's in figure eight, you're getting pick up here and pick up there and stick it right there between the tom-toms and you will be absolutely shocked at how good that sounds. I'm telling you, you will be shocked. Okay, so there's, uh, now we've got three mics going, kick, snare, rack toms. Um, 
the only thing I've ever liked a Sennheiser 441 on is a floor tom. Sennheiser 421 works great on a floor tom. An AKG 212, I think it's called, we talked about that recently, or a 414 will sound really good on a floor tom. Um, so now we're up to, what, four microphones? Yes, we've got kick, snare, rack toms, floor tom, uh, and then take um, almost any microphone, and I'm not being sarcastic here, but take almost any microphone um, and, and stick it up over the drum kit about three or four feet above the drummer's head and just open that thing up and just keep rolling out low mids and bottom until um, you're not getting a lot of sound out of it. And there you go. That would give you a good drum sound. Now, if you take somebody who's an absolute rank amateur and they try and do that, it probably won't sound good. But if you take somebody who understands EQ really well, um, they can make that work. Um, and phase issues can be a problem, although you've got so few mics on this imaginary kit, probably wouldn't be. Um, I see the taxi car has left the office for the lockdown. Oh, because I turned it the other direction and shut the doors. Very observant, Amanda. Oh, tell Mrs. Lasko to, ooh, this is a great suggestion because I got to say, last night's cookies didn't turn out that well. They're a little bit dry and cakey. She made some two weeks ago that were amazing, and I put on two pounds because of them. Um, but these came out a little dry and cakey. Please tell Mrs. Lasko to Google the authentic Double Tree Hotel chocolate chip recipe. They finally revealed the recipe, and the cookies are unbelievably out of this world. Yes, they are. Um... I stay, I've stayed at several double trees in my lifetime. And yeah, the problem is that the cookies are really big and you can't eat several of them late at night because the sugar will keep you up. I've spent far too much time staring at the ceiling of a double tree. Um, I only have five mic stands. I've been experimenting with the Glenn Johns method in a bit more. There you go. This hour passed too fast. It did. It's amazing. I can't believe it's three minutes to five. Flanging in pre-digital days. Oh, man. <clears throat> we used to do a lot of this. First of all, at some point in my career, I had a Mutron biphaser, which was a, a stomp box, a pretty big one. It was actually like that big. Remember, it's kind of blue and gray, maybe a little purple on that thing. Everybody laughed at me because I wasn't using like um, uh, like an eventide flanger or any of the expensive stuff. I loved the sound of that Mutron biphaser. <clears throat> and I would actually patch it into the patch bay and use it like a piece of outboard. Excuse me a moment. <clears throat> I need a drink because I have a frog in my throat. Okay. So... Here's how you make a flanging sound uh, without having any digital gear. And this will be the end of the show today, I fear. Um, let's say you want to flange um, a lead guitar. Uh, let's say that guitar is on track 17 of your multi-track whatever tape <laughs> or, or your Pro Tools or your Logic, whatever. So you take the output of that channel 17 that track um and then you would send it uh, in my day we would do it in a patch bay with patch cables uh and we would take the output of whatever it was that we wanted to flange and send it to um a quarter inch tape machine and then another quarter inch tape machine um, in a perfect world they would have been mono machines but you can send it to just one side of a stereo machine then you take the output of those two machines and bring them back into what's called a malt, which is basically three or four holes in a patch bay that are all tied together. So they combine the signal in parallel. Uh, so now you've got the output of the console, output of the instrument that you want to flange going to two identical tape machines. They don't actually have to be identical. Um, 
and then take the output of those machines back into a malt so that they're combined. And then you can take the output of the malt and bring that back into yet another fader on your console. So when the guitar solo, let's say it's a solo, comes up and you want it to flange, you put the two tape machines into record and you're listening to them in playback mode. So you're listening off the playhead, not listening off the input side of the tape machines. So now you've got the same signal coming off two tape machines that back then they were quartz locked tape machines, meaning they were, there was literally a crystal, you know, somewhere on the motherboard that they used those little crystals vibrating at 60 hertz to control the speed of the tape machines. Not as good as what we've got today. Um, and you would take your thumb and put it on the flange. That's where the phrase came from. Put it on the flange of the reel of tape on one of the machines. And by applying more or less pressure with your thumb, you would control the speed of that tape machine. Thereby, you are varying the, the delay time from machine one is untouched and it's got a constant rate of speed. And now you're flanging the second one. So you're delaying the output of that signal going into the malt and that is causing it to go and make a phasing sound. So there you have it. How do I market a new reality show idea? Um, you market it by uh, writing up a treatment and make sure that it's got tension and release. That much I know. You need a lot of tension and release, which is good because that creates opportunities for our members who are doing um, uh, tension cues. Um, Am I talking about ADT? Uh, no, we actually use ADT as our alarm company, but I don't know. Honestly, I remember the phrase ADT. This is from 45 years ago. Um, automatic double tracking. Um, no, I'm not. That, it, it's not the same. Uh, with automatic double tracking, you did actually use a tape machine and you would just use one tape machine, signal in, record or playback head out, I mean. Um, so you were causing it to go to that tape machine where if the tape machine, uh, the distance between the record head and the playhead, let's say the, this is a really big record head and a really big playhead and the tape is going this direction. Well, the amount of time that it takes to get from here to there is the delay coefficient. So if you vary speed using the little knob on the tape machine, uh, very speed the tape, you're altering the time that it takes to get from point A to point B, and that's where you get the delay from. Um, Beatles used it first, if I'm not mistaken. That's possible. Um, okay, so there you go. Hope you guys enjoyed today's show, kind of all over the place. Um, and I will see you tomorrow. I have no idea what we're going to talk about. I think tomorrow should be a drinking show, though. I think I may actually bust out a drink for tomorrow's show because it's Friday. And don't forget, you absolutely have to be here for Monday's show. I do not believe that Gato Blanco has ever done an interview anywhere before. I mean, the guy's an enigma. He really is. He, he's like, he's kind of a ghost. Um, so... Thanks for joining us. Uh, I look forward to seeing you all tomorrow. And once again, may we uh, celebrate um, our good friend John Pearson's good health and speedy recovery. See you tomorrow for another, where's the audience, another exciting episode of Taxi's Quarantini Happy Hour. Woohoo! Maybe with a fish story. Good night, you guys. <laughs>